hands of God. Praise is the weapon, and I am a battle axe in his hand. Amen. God bless you, who those who are watching on our, our broadcast. Amen. God bless you. Share it. We love you. Uh, we are getting prepared, amen, to worship the Lord, amen, in spirit and in truth. Amen. Because God is so worthy to be praised. He has done so many things for us. Amen. Maybe perhaps, amen, some of us has forgotten, amen, what God has done for us, amen, and not recognizing, amen, his goodness until something else happened good, amen. And then we should realize that we serve a God who is worthy. We serve a God who is good, amen. We serve a God who blesses us with everything that we need, amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again. We give you praise, glory, and honor. Father, we forgetting about who we are. Amen. And we're going to praise you like we've never done before. We are excited to be in the house of God because God is so good. He keeping us alive. He protecting us. He, he provided for us. He given us all the things that we're in need of. And Lord, I pray this morning that you will just touch our little young people's Lord. Touch their little minds, their little hearts, Lord. Help them to continue to give you praise. Keep our pastor. Touch him right now, Lord. Give him the spirit and the wisdom to bring forth your word. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Let every heart say amen. amen. This little light of mine. Everywhere I go. This little light of mine. Everywhere I go.
Water you turned into wine? Into the darkness. Our God is greater. God is greater. And if our God is for us. Our God is greater. God is greater. And if our God is for us, Stand again. The work can stand against. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. How many you glad to be in worship on this morning? God is good. He is indeed greatly to be praised. I want to just rise to just recognize, see if there are, first of all, any first-time visitors visiting with us perhaps for the first time here in Mount Cairo. So by chance, if you don't mind waving your hand at us, I promise I won't make you say anything. I uh, just want to recognize you. Come on, let's give them a great hand. It is our prayer that you be that you're blessed during today's worship, and we pray that if you do not have a church home, we do pray that it, well, one day that you will consider to make in Mount Calvary your church home. So if you don't mind, give them a hand one more time. Hey, are there any perhaps reoccurring visitors? Any reoccurring visitors? Any reoccurring? Y'all not reoccurring visitors, but okay. <laughs> It really, are there any reoccurring visitors? <laughs> all right, seems like we're all home, folks. So if you don't mind, just turn to your neighbor, Nate, tell your neighbor good morning. 
Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's so good to see all of you on this Sunday morning. Just got a few updates I want to share, and then we'll continue in our worship experience. Of course, looking forward to, to worshiping God and studying the Word together on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock p.m. It is my prayer that if your schedule permits you uh, to come and study God's Word, it is my prayer that you come with us as we study God's Word together in the Word. So again, that's 6 o'clock p.m. on this Wednesday. Uh, I believe Through through Sleet's Eyes Festival will be taking place at the River Park Center on February 24th and February 25th. I believe the admission is free, and so those of you who would like to partake in that, again, those dates are February 24th and February 25th. Uh, again, many of you already know uh, death has struck our congregation, and of course, on this coming Saturday, will be hosting the homegoing celebration of Sister Cynthia Johnson. Uh, the first service will be on February 25th. The viewing will be at 10 a.m. The homegoing celebration will be at 11 a.m. It is my prayer that I'm asking all of our music staff and our choir and even those who are leaders of this church to be here in support uh, of that family. Of course, many of you know just maybe five or six weeks ago we uh, funeralized brother Robert Johnson just five or six weeks ago uh, now his wife our former member sister Cynthia Johnson of course went home to be with the Lord so it's my prayer that you cover that family in believing prayer can you do that for me amen, amen. of course we had ministers training that was set for next week but due to the funeral uh, we're going to reschedule and I promise I'll uh, communicate with all of our ministers and even our ministers in training on when we will reschedule our time together. And with that being in mind, I want to take this time out so we can go to God in prayer. Of course, many of you have known there's so much going on in our world. And I want to take this time out where we can go to God in prayer. James lets us know that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And so those of you who have desired to come to the altar, I'm going to ask you if you could be so kind uh, to come to the altar as we go to God in prayer. First Peter lets us know we're able to cast all our cares upon him, knowing he cares for us. And so what I'm going to do, those of you again who have, who have a desire to come to the altar, you can come at this time. Those of you who want to stay in your seats, you're able to do so. But during this time, I'm going to ask, like I did at 8 o'clock, I'm going to ask our children to come a little closer and I'm also going to ask Minister Terry Edwards to lead us in prayer uh, during this time. Let me tell you, church, prayer ought to always be in order. I told you on last week, I think prayer ought to always be your steering wheel, not your spare tire. Meaning you ought to pray to God every opportunity that you get. You ought not, prayer ought not be optional, but we ought to always have to take the time out to come to God in prayer. And so as we go to God in prayer, I'm going to ask you if you don't mind being sent to yourselves as we go to God in prayer. Father, we just, we come humbly, vulnerable, sad, disgusted. But Lord, you have all of us in your hands. Father, I pray right now as the one that is present before the altar, Father, those are standing far away in the congregation. Father, you see us. You know what we're in need of. Father, I pray that you shower down in your sanctuary on those who are mourning right now. It's still mourning for some quite while. Father, right now, I pray that you give them comfort right now. In the time of abridement, Father, you comfort them right now. Father, let them know that there is hope. Hope in you that their day will get better as the time prolongs. Father, I pray right now for the mother who have lost a child. Father, that is breathing right now. Father, I pray that you will comfort her mind right now. Let her know that you're holding her up. In your arms, in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for the father who have lost a daughter. 
Father, I pray that you would give him the, the strength and the power to be able to hold on and to know, Lord God, that you are with him. Father, I pray right now that you be a veil over all of us. And Lord God, you will protect us from the hands of the enemy when we are out and about. Father, I pray that you will keep the enemy for a distance from us. Father, keep us in these last and evil, dreadful, hateful, and mean days right now that we are living. Father, come down right now. Give us the directions that we don't know how. Give us direction that we don't see right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for strength that you will allow us to be able to stand firm against the enemy right now. Father, help us right now in the name of Jesus. Father, someone is going to poverty right poverty right now. They don't need, they need in a need right now, Lord God. They're in a financial battle right now. They in a mother and a sister, amen, that is combated against each other. Father, bring together in love. Help us to love one another. Not to look at one another, amen, out of funny eye, but look at each other in love in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you will honor your peoples today that may be sick of some kind of disease. Father, I pray that you will heal right now. And Father, I pray that in, e in these days that you will give us the wisdom, that you will give us the, the knowledge, and that you will give us the conscience to live right. Father, I thank you. We give you praise, glory, and honor. Let every living heart say amen. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. loves me
If you don't mind bowing your heads for a word of prayer. As we ask God to bless our time in the word. Lord, thank you. That you are a God who loves us. Lord, even at times that we are unlovable and we perhaps at times don't show the same love towards you. Lord, that we thank you that you continue to love us in spite of us. And so, Lord, it's time to preach your word. Lord, prepare a preacher and people that will live more receptive and more responsive to your word. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, it is my prayer that you've been blessed in our series entitled First Giving Honor to God. For those who are visitors, this particular sermon series helps us to understand how we really honor God in the area of our stewardship. You know, if you've been to any good Baptist church, oftentimes at a good church, they'll first always say, first giving honor to God, who's the head of my life. You know, they'll often give recognition to the pastor, the saints, and even the ants at times. And the first thing that they always do is say is first give an honor to God. So this month we tried to have been trying to help us understand what it really means to first give honor to God. With that in mind, I want to continue into the in this series. I want to call your attention to a real familiar passage of scripture. If you don't mind turning your Bibles with me to First Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17, and for those of you who may have been turned off by me talking about giving, I promise, I think there's some great lessons I think that can help us in looking at this passage. First Kings chapter 17, and it is in your hearing, I want to commence reading at verse 8. First Kings 17, starting at verse 8. First Kings 8, First Kings 17 verse 8 says these words. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and stay there. Behold, I command a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour and the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a stick so that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus said the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty. Until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth, so, we, so she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. I want to talk about simply this thought, the blessing in giving. The blessing in giving. I, I believe, church, one of God's greatest desires for you and I as we grow in our walk with the Lord is that God desires for you and I to have a generous heart. God desires for you and I in essence to be led by the Holy Spirit and he wants us to recognize the opportunities we have to surrender ourselves from selfish living and to sacrifice the goodness of God and to give back as the Lord requires of us. What, what I, in essence, what I'm suggesting to you, friends, is that 
God wants us to get to the place where we can give without complaint, give without excuse, and give without reservation. After all, this is why Paul, I believe, says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says it this way. He says, but this I say, he says, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. But he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as his purpose in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly nor even out of necessity. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. And so the reason as to why God wants you and I to give cheerfully is because giving is the way in which you open your life for God to give back to you. Hear me, church. Anytime you give, God will always give back more. And that whatever you release to God, God will always restore you with more. That whenever you surrender to God, God will always supply you with more. Whenever you obey God, God will always provide for you. I'm trying to tell you, whenever you give to God, you can never go wrong. The reason as to why this is important is because I believe the body of Christ, and even then specifically our church every now and then is wounded every week by people who gather for worship and but yet excuse themselves from giving. You, you, you know, for some of us, we, we come in with a, with, our, with a Bible. Women, we're Baptist beautiful. Men, perhaps we're Baptist sharp. You, you drove your nice car. However, you, you sit at times in the sanctuary and excuse yourself from giving. And you know, oftentimes we've, we've heard the excuses people use before as to why people don't give. You know, we get to saying things like, well, the Lord knows my heart. Or, or some of us, we get the excuse, uh, I, I can't afford to tithe this week. Or for some of us, we will claim because we have a, a, a decent membership, you, you assume the church doesn't need my giving. And you know, there's always someone who says, um, I, I won't give because in your estimation, you believe all the money goes to the preacher. And, and listen, friends, when you don't give and when you don't obey the command of God to release his resources back into his kingdom, I want you to know you're not necessarily hurting the church as much as you are hurting yourself. Because when you give, I want you to know God gives back to you. And when you give, he'll give back more. And when you give, he'll give back more. And when you give, he will give back more. And when you give, you develop the cycle. You will quickly find out that when I obey God and give God as he has called me to give, the Lord will always provide for me. And I hear someone in your sanctified imagination is saying, Reverend, I didn't come to church to hear you preach about giving. I know you're saying that in your own mind, but I really want you to know, if you just walk with me just for a few moments this morning, I want you to know, I think there are really some great lessons that I believe I just want to tell the story today. I mean, I don't have no points this morning. I just want to tell the story of First Kings 17 because I believe there's some lessons and there's some benefits when we learn the blessing in giving. So here in First Kings 17, you'll know, that, they, that the nation of Israel is, in essence, is divided into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom is called Judah, and the northern kingdom is called Israel. The southern kingdom is comprised of two tribes. However, the northern kingdom is comprised of ten tribes. And in the south, the kings of Judah are all in the lineage of David. They're, they're blood relatives of David. Therefore, the southern kingdom is protected under the covenant that God made with David. However, in the north, the kings are not related. David, are not related to David, but in essence, the north goes through a series of random kings, which, which each king is worse than the former. If you read your Bible, you'll discover that things get pretty bad in the northern kingdom. 
that there was a king by the name of Omri who had a son that made Omri look righteous because Omri had a son named Enoch. Perhaps you don't know much about Enoch, but maybe you maybe you may not have heard much about uh, King Ahab. But many of us, if you never heard about Ahab, many of us have probably heard about Ahab's wife, whose name was Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel led the children of Israel to worship the god idol named Baal. And here it is in 1 Kings 16 that the Bible says that Ahab provoked God to anger more than any other king before him. The Bible tells us that God is so displeased with Ahab that to get a word to Ahab, God pulls out his prophet by the name of Elijah. And here, Elijah is, recog is the recognized voice of God on the earth. I, I, I mean, everyone in Israel knows that when Elijah speaks, God is speaking. And so here it is in this text. God gives Elijah a word. He tells Elijah, hey, go, go, go to Ahab. And uh, t tell Ahab that I said there will be no rain on the earth until I speak again. God declares that there, that there will be a drought in Israel. Now, if you understand agriculture, you, you'll know that, 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 a, that a drought quickly leads to a famine. Because if there isn't any rain, there cannot be a harvest. And so Elijah goes to Ahab and says, God is so upset with you that the Lord is going to cause a rough season to come on the earth and people are going to struggle. Resources will be reduced. And here Elijah says, uh, it, it will be a lean season. Because there won't be any rain. And notice at the time of this text in the middle of this season where there is a drought and a famine. The Lord decides that no matter what's going on in the land, he's going to provide for his servant Elijah. And I want to take a moment here, friends, and I want you to know, friends, that no matter what's going on in your current land or whatever is going on in your life, I want you to know God can provide for his children. Yeah, even in times of recession, I want you to know God is a provider. In times of layoff, God is a provider. In times of grief, God is a provider. In times of cutback, God is a provider. Even in times of reduced resources, God is a provider. I'm trying to tell you, if you trust in the Lord, God is able to provide for his children. And if you look at this text, God says, Elijah, down to a brook of water called Cherith. And it is there that God commands ravens, birds of the air, to find food for Elijah and for Elijah to eat. M maybe that didn't move you because perhaps you don't understand ravens in today's culture. Ravens believe in not only existence, in life is to eat everything that, that they find. But and they, they, they're, they're, they, ravens consume everything, but here the ravens are here to consume everything, but they're supposed to bring all the food back to Elijah. Because here God is trying to teach Elijah the lesson that he's trying to teach you and I to see, and that is when you trust God. And when you obey God's word and when you do what God has commanded you to do, the Lord will provide for you in places and in ways that you didn't expect. I, I mean, perhaps I wonder, is there anybody here that can testify God, God blessed you in perhaps in some ways you didn't expect? I mean, perhaps there was a check you didn't know that was in the mail, a, a job you didn't know that knew your name. I mean, th that is because our God is able to provide. And perhaps in the words of my grandma, my, my grandma would say it like this, the Lord will make a way somehow. She'll say, I don't know when, I, I don't know how, all, all I know is God will make a way. And so in the midst of God feeding Elijah with ravens, no, no as he tells Elijah to get up and go to Zarephath. Now, uh, Lord, if the ravens are working, and I'm getting fed here, the question becomes for Elijah, why, Lord, does you want me to go to Zarephath? Elijah gets up and goes because he realizes if I get up and go, God will provide. Watch the text. The Lord tells Elijah, I I'm sending you to Zarephath because according to verse 8, the Bible says there's a widow down there. 
the, the, the widow whose husband has died and because her husband has died she has no income and since she has no income in the midst of a famine her resources are running low her bills are high and her money is low she's struggling trying to see how ends will meet she, she doesn't know uh, how she's going to make it but watch the text the Lord sends Elijah to a situation like that to teach this woman I can provide for you if you learn how to give. He says, if you learn how to obey God and surrender what God has asked of you, if you learn to release your resources, if you learn to break yourself from selfish living, he says, you open the door for the Lord to provide for you continually for you and your household. If you don't believe me, just, just watch how this text unfolds. Elijah shows up. And he tells the widow woman in around verse 10, he says, hey, let me have a cup, cup of water. And notice the woman doesn't say anything. I mean, look at it. If you, if you keep your Bible open, notice what he says in verse 10. The Bible says, so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate to the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink notice again she Elijah asked for a cup of water and notice the woman doesn't say anything she, she decides I'm gonna go and get Elijah some water and maybe at this particular point point in the text maybe the woman recognizes who Elijah is and so she's trying to bless the man of God but then Elijah stops her in midstream walking and notice around verse 11 Elijah says, hey, give me some water and some bread too. I, I mean, look, if you keep your Bible, it, it says right there, she, she was going to get it. He called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. Now, now uh, the woman pauses. And now she has something to say. I admit, this woman had to be a sister in the text. I admit, she had to be a sister. Don't, don't miss this. The, the widow woman was headed to get water, and she had nothing to say. But now that Elijah asked for some bread, she now has something to say. So the widow woman turns around and says, Elijah, you're now asking me for too much. I, I mean, she says, I was willing, think about it, to give you some water. But I don't have any bread to give you. N notice the, the widow woman. Now, in essence, she draws a line and says, hey, uh, I, I was willing to do this, but I'm not willing to do that. Uh, uh, th think about it. She, she was willing to give Elijah some water. But now the fact that he asks for bread, now she thinks that's, that, that's too much. Let me ask you a question. At, at what point do you feel right telling God that he's asking too much of you? I, I mean, at what point do you look at your life and tell God, I can't do that? I mean, how, how do you justify being blessed by God and when God asks us of the tithe and the offering, you think that's too much to ask from you? I, 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 hear, I hear what you, I hear, I hear you in your own mind. I, I, I hear you saying, Reverend, that don't make any sense. I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But, but think about it. God healed your body. God, God gave you a roof over your head. He put clothes on your back. Well, well, how do you get to the point of telling God that's too much to ask? I hear someone else saying, Reverend, I, I, I'll stomach an hour and a half of worship. But, but I hear you saying, Reverend, don't ask me to give any money. Or, or I hear you saying, I'll give a dollar, but I, I'm not going to give the full tithe. Because for some of us, in our own minds, we, we think that's too much. But then I got to thinking, I want on the flip side, if God treated us the same way we treat him. You know, I wonder what we would do if we were to go to God and he responded, that, that's too much of me. That's too, that's too much. I, I could heal your body, but I, I'm not going to do that. You need God to provide for you, but he responded by saying, no, I'm not going to provide for you at all. 
And now, notice the, the widow woman in verse 12 starts to start making excuses. No, notice what she says in verse 12. He text says, but, he, she, but she said, as the Lord your God lives, she says, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go and prepare for me and my son that we may eat and die. She, she tells Elijah, I don't have any bread. L listen, friends, when you stand in front of the Lord at the day of judgment, I wonder, well, what excuses are you planning to give God as to why you are unfaithful? Well, what excuses you, are you preparing to give to the Lord as to why you couldn't do what God asked of you to do? I mean, what, what excuses are you going to give? And, and I encourage you to think about it now. Are you going to say, well, uh, God, you knew my heart. Uh, are, are you going, are, are, I mean, let's look at the text. The widow woman gives the excuse that many of us like to give. She says, I don't have it. She, sa she says it. She says, I have no bread, only a handful of flour and a bowl and a little oil in a jar. She says, I don't have it. Uh, here's my question. Are, are we the same way? And you know what times we ask the same way. Lord, we often tell the Lord, Lord, we, I don't have it. I, I, I need, we often say, Lord, I need that for my bills. I don't, I don't have it. And place a close attention, if you will, to what the widow woman says. Notice she's on her way. And just follow me here. She's on her way to get water. She knows where water is. Elijah asks for bread. And on her way to get some water, she responds by saying, all I have is flour and oil. Uh, uh, okay, you didn't catch it. I'll I, I play it again. No, it's all right. Uh, uh, she says, uh, um, Elijah, I, I, Elijah says, I, I want some bread. Uh, the, the widow woman here uh, is on her way to get water, and she responds, I don't have any bread. Uh, all I have is flour and oil, but she knows where some water is. You're still not catching it. Okay. Uh, no, this Elijah desires bread. As a widow woman is on her way to get some water, she says, all I have is flour and oil. If you, if you haven't figured it out, uh, uh, think about it. All you need to make bread is flour, oil, and water, which she already has. This is the point I want you to get. God never asked us to give a resource that he hasn't already given to us. God never asked you to give what you don't have. And li listen what God desires. God has already planted it in your life. The challenge is you and I have to recognize that God has given us already what God desires from us. I'm trying to suggest the Lord only asks for, from you what you already have. But look at the text. I, 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 I discovered the problem. I discovered the problem. Uh, I discovered the problem with the widow woman. Uh, uh, her problem was she assumed everything she had was for her own consumption. Think about it. That whatever the Lord blessed her with, she thought it was only for her. No, notice the text. See clause of verse 12. She, she says it this way. She said, behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat and die. She, she, she said, uh, 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 now remember, uh, she told Elijah she doesn't have any bread. But notice when she wanted some bread for herself, she found a way to get it done. Isn't it amazing <laughs> uh, how people can find the resources for the thing they want? But when it comes time to give to the Lord, all of a sudden, we can't afford it. I mean, think about it. We're, we're, we're creative economically when it comes time to spend. But then we become very frugal when it's time to give to the Lord. Uh, you know, you, you found money to get your hair done. Uh, you found money for that cruise you took. Uh, you found money to pick up the tab when you were, went to the club. For some of you, you may have already found tickets to go see the Queen Bee. Uh, here's a question. Uh, here's a question. What will you do when the day of judgment comes and the Lord pulls your spending receipts and lines them up with your offering envelope? 
And God says, interesting, you, you found money for everything you wanted to do. But when it comes time now for what I asked you now, you're uncapable. Interesting, when I asked for the time, you gave me a tip instead. Interesting, when I healed your body, you, you, you didn't even have enough sense to say thank you. Watch the text. The widow woman says, I, I'm, she, the widow woman says, I'm going to take all I have and I'm going to use it for myself and my son. And then we're going to die because, believe it or not, that's the inevitable outcome of when you take everything God has given you and use it on yourself. I want you to know financial death is always in the future of your life when you consume everything that God has given you. And this is, I'm saying, uh, listen, w when you live at 100% of your means and you spend more than you make, you have money for cars and homes and clothing, but you rob God in the house of the Lord. In essence, you're robbing yourself from the opportunity for the Lord to bless you. That, that, that's why I'm glad Elijah was there because Elijah comes and say, that's not how it has to go down. Because there's a way for the Lord to provide for you. And Elijah says, there's a way for the little you have to always be enough. He said, there's a way for the Lord to make sure your flour doesn't run out and your oil doesn't run dry. That, that, this is what Elijah says. This is all you got to do. Make the bread, but give me a small piece first. He, he says, you can make the bread and you can eat of the resources. But he says, give me a small piece first. I want you to pay close attention to that word small because everything God asks of us, believe it or not, is small in comparison to the everything that God has given to us. Uh, God asks for a tithe. This is he asks for 10%. Think about it. 10% is nothing. He, in essence, he asks for that we give him a dime out of every dollar. And, and I wonder this, I want you to think about this. Is that too much for God? Let me tell you how small 10% is. 10% is so small that if you heard that something was on sale and it was only 10% off, you wouldn't think it was on sale. Think about it. Uh, employee discounts are greater than 10%. And, and listen, this is what I want you to understand. It's not the small that matters. It's the first that matters. This is not so much your giving that matters, but it's the priority that matters. That's the reason God requires the tithe. It proves to God that God is the priority in our lives. That is what I'm trying to get you to understand is there's, there's nothing that comes before God. That before I give to anyone else, I ought to give to God first. I'm just saying we ought to make God a priority in our financial lives. And watch the text and I'm done. The widow woman finds out that when I make God a priority, the Bible says that the oil never ran out. She always has something to eat. That when I give to God, God will always give back to me. I believe that's why the songwriter said you can't beat God's giving. No matter how hard you try, the more you give, the more he gives to you. Just keep on giving because it's really too Why? Because you can't be God's giving. No matter how hard you try. I, I'm done, but I, I, got, I try to think about how I could try to make this sermon live. Uh, I, I need some help. Uh, uh, can I see you? You in the green. I need, your, I need your help. I, I'm done. I, I want to see how I can make this sermon live. Uh, yeah, come, come on up. Come on. You, you ain't not, you're not in trouble. You're not in trouble. Uh, what's your name? Toy. What's your last name? Miss Carp. All right. Uh, Jeremiah Parks. Uh, case. I don't know everybody's name. I can't always assume. Uh, uh, I don't know what you're, I, I want to see if I can see if I can try to make this sermon live. I want to be a blessing. Uh, so what I'm going to do is give you this envelope. Uh, go ahead and look in it. All right. No, don't count it. No. no. Don't count it. Don't count it. Don't, don't count it. Uh, but I appreciate you. Thank you for everything you did. Go ahead and have a great day. No, no. 
Oh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm, hold on, hold on, hold on. Come on, come back. Uh, you should have about maybe five ten dollar bills. It might be a five in there. Could, would you be mad if I asked you for a five back? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's all I needed. Okay, go ahead. Oh, hold on, my bad, my bad, hold on. <laughs> my bad. Okay, here you go. Oh, yeah, go ahead and look at it. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, it should be probably about the same amount. I, I need, can I get another five out of that? Other envelope? Uh, oh, so it's just you gave back here. Uh, can I get five more dollars out of that? Appreciate it. Well, come on, one more. Last one is a lunch bit of char. Can I get five more dollars? Okay, uh, I'm just trying to tell you, giving works. Have a great day, keep it. Come on, we stand all over the building. Right. Today, if you're here, oh, it's, yeah, it's yours. Uh, I, I don't know what you need. Okay. I'm just trying to tell you, giving works. Giving works. Today, if you're here, today, if you're here, unsaved or unchurched, I just want to encourage you that perhaps maybe you're not connected to the God I was just talking about. I want to encourage you to make God Lord of your life. Perhaps you've tried God in so many other ways. This is all I really want you to do. I really want you to consider trying God the right way. So if today, if you're here, unsaved or unchurched, uh, I want to encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ. If you don't mind, come on, let's stand. Everyone stand if you don't mind. All over the building. Again, you come here led by Christian experience, candidate for baptism. Perhaps you're a student here in the area. Perhaps you have a church home. Uh, we could be your watch care church until you go back home. I just want to encourage you to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. If you, if you were to die today, the question becomes, do you know where you will spend eternity? And if you, don't know, if you can't answer that question with a surety, I want you to consider to give your life to Jesus Christ. Perhaps someone else here, you, you don't like crowds, you, you don't wanna walk, and here, that's fine. See any of these leaders up front, or you or myself, we can share with you as to how you can unite uh, with this church. Perhaps you, maybe you online, you, maybe you online, uh, you online, uh, the information should be on your screen as to how you can unite with this church. I just wanna encourage you, don't put off tomorrow what you can do for the day. Tomorrow may be delayed, but if I want, all I want to do is I want to pray for you. I want to pray. Maybe someone really needs to make a decision. If you really need to make a decision, I want to pray that the Lord give you strength to make a decision. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these, your people. Lord, bless my brother and my sister who may need to make a decision to make you Lord of their life. Bless them. Give them strength. Let them know that they're not amongst judges, but they are amongst friends. And it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, be your mind. Put your hands together. Give God great praise. Amen. Church, we now have an opportunity.
to honor God in the area of our giving. Of course, many of you have already heard my soapbox again. If you don't have a job, we're not, you can't give to God what you don't have. And so my whole premise of this sermon series is to really help you understand that if you really think uh, Reverend was trying to guilt trip you into giving, I want you to know you missed the whole premise of the whole series. The premise of the series helps us to understand that what is often put in our hands oftentimes has the ability to reveal what's in our hearts. And so once again, if you don't have, if you don't have a job, we're not asking you to give anything. However, if God has blessed you with something, then my prayer is that you give to God what belongs to him. The Bible says, he says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And then he says, prove me now, says the Lord of hosts, that if I not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive. And so those of you who may need an envelope, feel free to raise your hand. One of our listeners will be more than glad to assist you, but perhaps you don't, you're not a cash or check person. There you can go to the Tively app, type in Mount Calvary Baptist Church. There you'll be able to give in a secure way. Are you ready to give? Well, if you're ready to give, I'm going to pray, and then we'll be in the hands of our ushers. Lord, thank you for every gift and every giver. And Lord, we pray that these gifts will be for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're in the hands of our ushers. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Again, as we get ready to leave this place, I pray that you have a safe weekend. And to all of our visitors, we want to say thank you so much for coming and worshiping with us. And we pray that you come back real soon. Receive this blessing. Now may the grace of God, sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, may it rest and reform and renew this day. And then the days ahead until we meet at Jesus' feet, the bishop of the church, the bishop of our souls, go in peace. Go and love, go and serve. Have a wonderful weekend. Be blessed.